Exodus chapter 19, okay? I'll read from verse 1. In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus, shall, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, let's read verse 5 and 6 together. One, two, go. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Six, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the children of Israel. And these are the words that I speak to you this morning, that you shall be a kingdom of priests. Amen. Amen. And so, my Father, we want to thank you and bless you. Thank you for visiting us mightily this morning. Thank you for those you have already strengthened and comforted, those that you have already spoken to, those that you have ministered to all by yourself. And so, Lord, now we ask that you show us mercy one more time and anoint us to speak, anoint us to have a conversation, anoint us to hear, and help us to understand what we have heard. But best of all, Father, we ask for the strength to do that which we have understood. Thank you, my Father. In Jesus' excellent name, we pray. Amen, amen and amen. Now, um, the scripture says in First uh, Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are a peculiar people and that we are called to show forth certain things. We are called to show forth the praises of God. Now, this concept of a kingdom of praise is something that we have spoken about over and over and over again. And we'll keep talking about it until we get into that frame of mind, that spirit that makes us understand that we are priests and that we are ordained to be priests and we live our lives accordingly and the good Lord will help us. Amen? Now, the word priest, um, in its original sense, means an officiating minister, officiating person, a principal officer. That's what the word priest means. Now, in, in the Greek, for those who, you know, read a lot of Greek and all, it has its roots in holiness, in the word holy. And so, it's kind of over the years has been restricted to um, um, religious settings. Okay, so when we say priest, we we'll look, we, you know, especially if you are involved in orthodoxy, in Anglicanism and uh, the Episcopal Church and Catholicism, when they say priest, what you have in mind is a man or a woman wearing a cassock and wearing that tall bishop cap and wearing that staff, carrying that staff and moving around very holy. That's the idea, the concept, the understanding of who a priest is, an ordained member of the clergy. But if you look in the scripture, originally a priest was simply a messenger, a servant of God, somebody who spoke for God, somebody who stood for God, somebody who stood between man and God and brought God's word to man and took man's concerns to God. That's who a priest was originally. But like I said, over the years, the word had become perverted and the meaning has changed over time. Now, in, 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 in life, you'll find this change over and over again, where something starts off meaning one thing, and then later on, it means something else. Several years ago, um, when I was still, um, how do you put it, an academic, 
we, we wrote a paper, we published a paper on the etymology of words, okay, etymology of legal words. And so we had to do a research into finding out what words meant originally and how they morphed over time and they now acquired a new meaning. For instance, the word guy, G-U-Y, um, when it's in the French, it's pronounced G. You know what the original meaning of that word was? It meant a thief. But now, when you say the word guy, it means a smart person, a smart male person. When you say the word guy, it means someone who is sharp, who looks like gay. You understand what I'm talking about? But in the beginning, that's what it meant. Well, let me throw in another one. Hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to see if I'm safe. Okay. So there's a lawyer over there, so let me move this way. Now, who can tell me the original meaning of the word lawyer? <laughs> they don't like you. <laughs> the original meaning of the word lawyer was what? A thief. <laughs> it wasn't a lawyer. Eh? <laughs> so, if, so if you check the etymology of the word, see, you find out that the original meaning of the word lawyer was what? A thief. There, there's so many other words like that that have morphed. And so the word priest has also morphed from being a messenger from heaven, an ambassador from the kingdom of God, a man or a woman who forms a link between heaven and earth to what we now see that it is today, a select group of people wearing fancy clothes and preaching the word of God to us. But originally, it was not meant to be that way. Amen? Amen? In Exodus chapter 19 that we read, we see the original intent of God. We see the original plan of God. We see what was in God's mind when he ordained priesthood. We see that he called out the entire nation of Israel and he told them that every single one of them was what? A priest. He told them that every single one of you, all 12 tribes, is what? A priest. And every Israeli could approach him by themselves because they were all priests. Every single one of them. That's the original intent of God. That is original desire of God. So that every man, every woman could stand before God and bring heaven down to the earth. As we see in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10 where he says, thy kingdom come. Amen? Amen. And so, this is the plan of God. This is what God intends for us to do. What he intends for us to become. Each one of us a priest. Each one of us being a link between heaven and earth. Each one of us carrying the concerns of man and women and children back to God. Acting always in the place of a priest. Now, the original intent of God is not, it hasn't been abrogated, it hasn't been abolished. It hasn't been forgotten. God's plan is still the same. So today, God is still looking for who? Priests. He's searching for priests. He's searching for people, men, women, children, who will stand between him and the earth. People who will lift up their hands and say, Lord, stay your judgment. Lord, remember so and so. And people who will bring the mind of God from heaven and declare it to men. This is the heart desire of God and it still has not what changed. Now look at the depth and the magnitude of what God did in the life of the children of Israel in that day. Watch this. In one day, they went from being slaves to becoming priests of God. In one day, they went from servitude and suffering and all that they were going through so being able to stand and hear the creator of the universe speak to them and they said it sounded like thunder. In one day, they experienced so much of the power and the grace and the mercy of God. In one day, things changed for them completely and they became priests. 
You know the joy of priesthood? Perhaps the best thing about being a priest is that you can hear God. Amen? The best thing about being a priest is that you can hear God and God can tell you what tomorrow will be like. You have an idea of what your tomorrow will be like. You have an idea of what your family's tomorrow will be like. You have a guidance that no other person would have. Why? Because the God who dwells above time is your God and you are his what? His priest. And so, they came out. Oh, one more thing about being a priest. Romans 3 verse 1. Shall we read? One, two, go. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Now, this is the profit. Verse 2. Much in every way, chiefly because to them we are committed what? The oracles of God. So when you're a priest, the oracles of God are committed into your hands. Now, when I use the word oracle, you see, again, we have talked about the etymology of words. If you speak to a computer scientist and you say, is it oracle, oracle, oracle? How do you pronounce that word? Oracle. That's how I was born pronouncing it. When you speak to a computer scientist and you speak the word oracle, he or she begins to think about the, soft, the platform. When you speak to an African of African descent, and you use the word oracle, <laughs> it, it's different. You, you know why? Because when we hear the word oracle, we think of that oracle in the corner of the bush that you go and you make sacrifices to. But the oracle that is being spoken about here in Romans chapter 3 is the vehicle for the transmission of the knowledge of God. So that what the scripture is saying, Paul is speaking to the Romans and he is telling them that in the beginning, you guys were disadvantaged because the only place where you could learn about God was to go to an Israelite. Because God did not commit himself to anybody else. So if you wanted to know anything about God, you had to go to the Israelite to ask him, who is God? So the God of the universe packaged himself and delivered everything about himself into the hands of 12 tribes. And he said, the whole world will come to you. And he has not changed. Amen? The Bible says that a day will come when 10 people would run to a, a, an Israelite and hold him and say, we perceive that God is with you. Now take us to your God. Amen? And so the mind of God has always been to commit himself to his priest. So when you're a priest, you have knowledge of God. You have understanding of the ways of God. You can stand and say, when they crucify you, you can look at them and say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they were doing. Why? Because you're a priest of God. And you know the mind of God. Anyway, let me go on. And so, 12 tribes, all of them priests. And they're all feeling cool being priests. They went to Mount Horeb. They heard God speak. They saw the miracle. They ate a lamb, put the blood upon their lintels. Death passed over them. The Red Sea parted. The walls threw. Everything was going on well for them. A season came in the fullness of time. You see this in Exodus 32. When I was in um, catechism, is that what they call it, catechism? You know, when you start, it's catechism. When I was in catechism, they used to call it the story of the golden cow. A day came. Moses went up the mountain, you know the story, with Joshua. And then they delayed in coming down. And so the children of Israel, they, they relapsed to what they knew before. Stay with me now. They relapsed to what they knew before. And so they said to Aaron, who had been left in charge, make us gods. And so Aaron said, give me the gold in your ears and in your nose and around your ankles and your wrists. And the scripture says he threw it into the fire and out came a golden cow. Stay with me now. 
The golden calf, if you study Egyptian mythology, was never a god. The golden calf was the oracle of the gods of Egypt. They said that the gods of Egypt, Oris and Isis and uh, Anubius and those gods, that they were gods above men because they had the power and the authority to ride on bulls. So that whilst men could tame horses, stay with me now, they could tame a bull. But you see, I like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He went on to tame the wind. And so he says that he rides upon the wings of what? Of the wind. That's how great he is. But that's the story for another day. And so when he brought, when the Egyptians see the calf, they immediately know that a God is there. That's the understanding of the calf. So when they see the, 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 the calf, they know that a God is there. That is why the Egyptians, when Jacob came there, they refused to eat cow, um, um, bulls. They don't eat them. And so they told Jacob that what you do is anathema to us. So go and stay over there so that the Egyptians will not see you eating the oracle of their gods. The thing that carries their god for them. And so when, when, when Aaron brought forth that golden calf, what he was speaking was that this represents the God that brought you out of Egypt. And that was not only belittled God, he gave the glory of God to the gods of Egypt. Are you still here? Are you still here? So Moses comes down from the mountain. God had told him these people have rebelled. He sees the anathema. He sees what is going on. And he stands and he says, who is on the Lord's side? And then tribalism kicked in. <laughs> tribalism kicked in. The Levites remembered that Moses was their brother. And I, that's just me. The gospel according to me, amen. They remembered Moses was their brother. Anyway, long story short, the Levites got up en masse. And they went to Moses, leaving 11 tribes. Now, that was significant. Because that day, everybody made a choice. Just like today, at some point, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a choice. The choice they made that day has lived with them until today, after thousands of years. Brethren, the choice you make today will live with you forever. And so they made a choice. When they made a choice, the one tribe of Levi came around Moses and that day God changed the rules and he began to tell them that because Levi has stood up for the truth, now I have reduced the priesthood. That instead of 12 tribes, only one tribe will be priest. So instead of having a merger of the people of God and the priests of God, now there is a dichotomy, a division, a difference. For the first time on the face of the earth, we now had clergy and laity. We had priests and congregation. We had pastors and non-pastors for the first time on the face of the earth. How sad. How what? Sad. And so God's plan was reduced in the lives of the children of Israel. Now Reuben, the tribe of Reuben, were no longer priests unto God. In fact, if you read Numbers 3, 11 to 13, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, you would find out that God forbade them from coming in to speak to him. He put something in place. And he said, if you come to me in the holy place, you die if you're not a Levi. So the children of Israel were doing that. Then something else happened. You know the story. 
they went and they took Jer um, uh, Jericho, they did all of that. But the day came, a man was committing sin in the camp. He was sleeping with a woman who is not his wife. And so Phinehas, the son of Aaron, went and put a javelin. That guy must have been very strong. But the scripture says he put a javelin into the man, into the woman, and lifted up both of them before God to quench the anger of God. And then that day God changed the rules again. Stay with me now. And he said, from now henceforth, only the sons of Aaron would come into the holy place. And so the priesthood was further reduced. Sons of Aaron could be high priests. Levites could be priests. And every Israelite had to go to a Levite to find God. You know how bad it became? It was so bad for the 11 tribes that God told them that when you are dividing the land, don't give Levi any portion. Because I, the Lord, the owner of the land, I am Levi's portion. So that, listen carefully, when you are a priest of God, when you understand what a priesthood means, it simply means that God is your portion. See, that's why we sing that song. The Lord is my portion in the land of the living, where God is good forevermore. So when you are a priest, God is what? Your portion. And when you have God, he says the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. When you have God, you have what? Everything. So Levi had everything. Israelites went on captivity. And they wanted to pray and they began to search. Is there a Levite amongst us? They could do nothing without the priest. But this continued, the scripture says, until Jesus came. Jesus was special. Stay with me now. He was not a Levite. Amen? But he was special for several reasons. So after so many years, we see a non-Levite in the holy place. After several years, we see a non-Levite stand. The scripture tells us that one day he went to the cross and that darkness covered the entirety of the earth because his eyes cannot behold iniquity. And after he died, the Bible says that the veil of the temple was torn into two, signifying access for all of us. Amen? Amen? Stay with me now. Remember, the mind of God was for every single person to become what? A priest. That was the plan of God from the very beginning. So when that happened, any man, any woman that comes to God through Jesus is automatically what? priest. Entitled to the benefits of priesthood. The first benefit, of course, is that the Lord is what? Your portion. Second benefit is that you get to hear him speak to you. Third benefit is that he explains himself to you as a priest. Now, if you don't have these benefits manifesting in your life, maybe we'll pressure your priesthood a little bit. And so, we all became what? Priests. That's why in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says, he has made us kings and priests unto our God. That's why in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, he says we are what? A royal priesthood. Because our priesthood has a kingly element to it. When you get born again, when you get saved, when you accept Jesus, you become a priest. You fulfill the desire, the mind, the plan of God from the very beginning. That every man, every woman on the face of the earth would be able to approach him as a priest. And not have to go through someone else. 
So if I'm a priest, then I must live life as a priest. If you check in the scripture, if you check Leviticus, and there are restrictions for priests. <laughs> a priest doesn't drink alcohol. <laughs> you want me to say that again? A priest was forbidden to drink alcohol. Hmm. <laughs> okay, let me say it over there. There are some hard guys over on this side. A priest is forbidden to do what? To drink alcohol. It's one of the restrictions of priesthood. Hmm. Restriction number two. A priest is forbidden hmm. to have more than one wife and one husband. Give me five. Both official and unofficial. <laughs> you want me to say that again? A priest is forbidden to have more than one wife or more than one husband, both official and unofficial. What are the restrictions of priesthood? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, let me add one more. A priest is forbidden. From smoking, Opoka. <laughs> no. You have to go some 10,000 miles to a particular part of the African continent to understand the deep meaning of Opoka. <laughs> Whether it is Opoka of pipe, Opoka of cigarettes, Opoka of, uh, where's that thing that you are studying? Uh, electronic uh, Opoka. Whatever it is. A priest is forbidden from doing anything that will remove from the veracity and integrity of the priesthood. That's why Paul said, things might be lawful, but they're not what? Expedient. They're not expedient. Why? Because whatever we do as priests, it detracts if we do something negative from the priesthood. And that's why the world looks at the church and they begin to tell us that if you are priests of God and you are like this, then we don't want to know who your God is because we are bad representatives of the God that we claim to represent. Tell your neighbor you're a priest. No, no, tell them with conviction you are a priest. with me. When they asked Jesus about marriage, he told them, he said, in the beginning, it was not so. In the beginning, he made them male and female. And so, if you want to understand life, you go to the beginning. In the beginning, there was no distinction between the priesthood and the people. The between the priesthood and the life of the people. Their life was the priesthood. The priesthood was their life. So there is no distinction between your Christianity and your life. You can no longer say Christianity is Christianity and business is what? Business. Are you with me? We all are priests. The platform upon which we express our priesthood is just different. It's just different. My brother here is a priest. Come on, say a better amen for him. Amen. But he has chosen to express his priesthood by helping all of us with our taxes. Yeah, clap for him. He is an accountant. That is the platform on which he expresses his what? Priesthood. So he is a priest in church. 
He's a priest in his office. When he's defending you before the IRS, he's still what? A priest. Hallelujah. Um, who else? Now everybody's turning their heads. Away. Okay. My brother is a priest. Amen? But he has chosen to express his priesthood by giving us injections when we are sick. Am I making sense? So his, his practice is an expression of his priesthood. He's not a priest only on Sunday morning. He's a priest on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and on what? Sunday. If there is an eighth day added, he will still remain what? A priest. Tell your neighbor one more time. I am a priest. Listen, I am a priest first. Pastoring is just the platform for the expression of my priesthood. But I'm a priest first. So when I step up there, I am still what? A priest. I just have a different platform. She's a lawyer. That's the platform upon which she expresses her priesthood. And so we can't afford to draw a dichotomy that God wants to abridge. We can't afford to create a difference that was not there in the beginning. Because in the beginning, we didn't have pastors and uh, congregation. And watch this. If you check deep in the scripture, you will find out that there is absolutely no benefit that pastors have that everybody else doesn't have. There is no empowering. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when he says, stay here until you receive power from on high, it was for everybody. When he says, go, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It was for how many people? Everybody. Because all of us are priests. Amen? When he says, go and feed the poor, it's for how many people? All of us. Because we are all what? Priests. When he says, let your speech be seasoned with salt. <laughs> how many people? All of us. When he says, don't gossip, how many? Now, I want to hear this one. When he says, don't gossip, how many? <laughs> I hope you are going home today. <laughs> it is for all of us. The commandments, the blessings, because all of us, by the blood of Jesus, we are all priests before him. There's absolutely nothing I can do as a pastor that you cannot do. Nothing. The anointing is for all of us as priests. The power is for all of us. My prayer is that as we grow day by day, we'll continue to express our priesthood in everything that we do. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say amen. amen. There's something that I forgot. Some women express their priesthood in wifey. And some men express their priesthood in husbanding. Amen. So the husband must husband as a priest. And the wife must wife. And the children must children. And the grandmothers must grandmother. That's who we are. Never forget that. And as we continue in life, we pray that this will be our testimony always. In the mighty name of Jesus. Isaiah 61. We'll close on this. You see, when we gather on Sunday, it's actually a gathering of priests who have come together to strengthen one another, to encourage one another, 
to put a smile on the face of one another. Corporate worship so we can hear from our God and then we go out there and manifest our priesthood. Amen? Listen, listen, listen. It is not one of the benefits of priesthood to give your wife a dirty slap or even a clean one. It's not a benefit of priesthood. It's not a benefit of priesthood to give your husband a piece of your mind. Because you know what God said about the mind? He said it's what? Evil and desperately wicked. So when you give your husband a piece of your mind, you give him a piece of evil and a piece of desperate wickedness. Now this is the gospel according to me. Amen? <laughs> Isaiah 61. Oh, verse 1. Let's read together. We are going down to verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Verse 6, But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Now someone say, Amen. Amen. This is your portion. Amen. But did you notice that your responsibility came before your blessing? Amen? Did you notice that we all are priests and we all have the same calling to the poor, to those who mourn? And so the next time you want to say, the church is not doing anything, just look at yourself and just say, the priests are not doing anything. Amen? The next time you say, the, the, the choir is not singing well, just look at yourself and say the priests, they are not singing well because everything that they do, we should be doing also. Amen? Amen. Shall we rise to our feet?